Okay. Yeah, so first of all, thanks very much to the, thank you. Thanks very much to the organizers, or sorry, to the Swamp Rangers uh, <laughs> for, uh, for setting up this meeting. Indeed, the timing is, uh, is absolutely perfect. Um, so I'm going to talk about work that's with uh, uh, Thomas Backlechner, uh, Oliver Jansen, and Kate Eckerly. Um, so Oliver is my student, and he'll be graduating this year and is on the market. He's very, very good. Uh, and, and it's based on, on two papers that are out and, and two more that are, um, that are about to come out, hopefully soon. So uh, as you all know, people have wondered for a very long time, at least since Dirac, probably before, about why uh, there's such an enormous ratio between um, the size of the universe, the length scales associated with cosmology, and anything that we see in uh, what we believe are, are fundamental laws of physics, like particle physics. So there's some huge ratio, like 10 to the 60 or so. Um, <clears throat> you could also ask, uh, and, and Cameron just mentioned this, and I'll, I'll come back to it uh, a little bit later, about the, the sort of why now problem, the coincidence problem. So why, uh, at the time when we live, when the universe is, is 10 billion years old, is dark energy dominating? It doesn't seem to have dominated before. And also why the universe is so smooth and isotropic on large scales, but not on small. Now, um, <clears throat> of course, these questions are, are, are closely connected to the cosmological constant problem. Because if the cosmological constant took its natural value, then the universe would be tiny. It would have a very tiny radius, and there'd be no question like this. Uh, <clears throat> so the first thing you have to do is, is solve the CC problem to answer these questions. Um, but that's really not enough. Um, if you want to explain uh, why dark energy is dominating now, for instance, if you want to talk about radiation and matter. So is there a way we can put all this together? Is there some framework which can address all these questions? OK, so, so the, the sort of, uh, as far as we know, the, the, the history of the universe looks like this as an executive summary. So there was some kind of event, the Big Bang. There was some period of inflation. There's pretty strong evidence for that now. Uh, and then the universe was radiation dominated, matter dominated until fairly recently, and now dark energy dominated. So I'm going to go through these in, in kind of reverse order. So uh, again, as, as Kumran mentioned, we've known for some time that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And certainly the simplest explanation for that data is that, uh, th is that there's some form of dark energy which is constant, which doesn't change as the universe expands. Now, uh, if that's true, then we need, it seems, some sort of discretium, some kind of landscape of different values of lambda in order to find at least one which is consistent with this tiny value that we observe. And uh, if that's the case, if there is such a huge landscape, the reason why we observe such a tiny value of the CC is because only in regions of the universe dominated by that phase is there any life. Are there any people making observations and asking this question? OK, so this was Weinberg's classic prediction um, for the CC. And, and, and what it tells you is that uh, at least if the fundamental scale of the theory is close to M Planck, you need at least 1 over lambda, or 10 to the 120, phases. You need that many uh, metastable to sitter minima. So a few months ago, we went from 10 to the 500 to 0. And now, at least for the purposes of this talk, we go from 0 back to 10 to the 100 or 10 to the 500. Uh, a bit dizzying. But anyway, this is how many phases you would need if you're going to, uh, if you're going to invoke this landscape ex explanation for, um, for why the CC is so small. But one thing that I think is, is perhaps underappreciated is that although it's necessary to have this many phases to explain cosmology, it's certainly not sufficient. And the reason is that uh, the universe has more to it than just the present epoch. In, in other words, uh, it's true that, uh, that for structure to form um, uh, around now, you need lambda to be no larger than uh, roughly the observed value. But it's not necessarily true that structure will have formed if lambda had that value. So uh, a classic example of this is in a landscape where, um, where these phases are populated by tunneling from some higher phase, then the Big Bang, the origin of our part of the universe, is the formation of a bubble. And when these bubbles form, you can describe them as negatively curved, open FRW cosmologies. Open curvature means expansion faster than the critical expansion rate. And rapid expansion like that uh, inhibits structure formation. So a universe that formed like that through a phase transition um, will not form any structure. It will be dominated by, uh, by negative curvature. It will just expand so rapidly that, that nothing ever collapses and no structures form, no matter how big the dark energy is inside it. And to get rid of that curvature, you need inflation. So uh, 
uh, even if you had a landscape which contained phases with small lambda, if you got into them by tunneling, and that tunneling was not followed by inflation, you would never form any structure, and uh, this entropic explanation would, would fail. There's other problems with uh, this Weinbergian approach. Um, so uh, another one is, is that uh, in, in, uh, in that analysis, you assume that delta rho over rho is about the observed value, that it's roughly a, a few times 10 to the minus 5. Um, but if you had this huge landscape with all these different phases, you might expect that delta rho over rho would scan, that there would be ways to form universes in these different phases where delta rho over rho could be, say, close to order 1. And in that case, structure won't be rare. Um, uh, structure can form even if lambda is, is relatively large because it's close to nonlinear to begin with. So you could have a much larger value of lambda if delta rho over rho can scan. So ideally what you'd want to do is take a landscape that you thought might solve the CC problem and then study all the cosmological histories in that landscape, uh, require or only look at those in which structure forms, and then ask what do those have in common? Do they have small lambda? Do they look like our universe in other ways? But um, any theory which has this many phases, it certainly sounds daunting uh, to, 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 do, to do that. In fact, it's been argued in the past that it's an NP-hard problem to find uh, a vacuum which has a, a vacuum energy that's in, in some uh, small range like this. And so if finding minima is that hard, good luck studying dynamics, things like cosmological histories and so forth. So what I'm going to do in this talk is tell you about a particular landscape. It's a, a toy in the sense that it's, um, it contains only some degrees of freedom, uh, not everything. But I'll tell you about this landscape. And it's a landscape in which, if you like, you can choose the parameters randomly and everything at the gut scale. So there are no small, uh, the, the only dimensionful scales are at the gut scale. There are no small parameters in it. Uh, and there's certainly no tuning because you can choose everything randomly. But what you'll see is that in a landscape like that, Essentially, all these questions that I mentioned are addressed. That, in fact, this landscape succeeds much more than you might have thought. It doesn't only explain why the CC is small. It explains these other features of the universe uh, that, that, that I mentioned. Um, and so, in particular, um, oh, and another thing about it is that it's tractable. Okay, so you don't have this problem with, with NP hardness. It's simply not true that it's hard to find uh, minimum with vacuum energy in some range, like the one on the previous slide. In fact, you can do it on your laptop. Um, and that's because there are some symmetries of this model which allow you to find minima like that very efficiently. And this, so this will be an axion landscape. Most of these will be very heavy axions. Um, but I will mention near the end, if I have time, uh, uh, the connection with, uh, with ultralight dark matter. Now, I'm not going to address directly this, uh, this question of the swampland. So, so um, uh, it could be that, uh, that no theories like this exist at all. Maybe there are no metastable to sitter minima. Um, I think you can think of this, though, as a nice counterpoint to Cumberenstock. Um, if there are no de metastable de sitter minima, then this is what you're giving up. You're giving up what seems to me um, a rather attractive explanation for many of the features of our universe. So that's a challenge, not to say that there isn't some other way uh, to explain those features, but um, your work is, is cut out for you. <clears throat> okay, so, so um, in string theory compactifications, one often has hundreds of, of, uh, of axions. And uh, what I'll do in, in, in this talk is just look at the axion sector. So you can think of this as inspired by string theory, but it certainly doesn't contain all of its ingredients. But I'll take the most general theory I can take within the axion sector, or close to the most general. So this is a theory with n axions, these thetas, um, with some arbitrary kinetic term that I just assume is quadratic in the thetas. So k is some constant but uh, otherwise arbitrary matrix, positive matrix. And then a potential, which is um, a sum of periodic functions. It's not extremely important that they be cosines, uh, but it should be a sum of periodic functions with some coefficients, typically called lambda to the fourth. And those cosines, are, in, in their argument, is some linear combination of these axion fields, including a phase, uh, and with coefficients which should be integers, or they could be rationals, uh, but in any case, let's, let's assume they're integers for simplicity, uh, so that, in fact, these are axions. This potential is periodic under... Uh, uh, under, under uh, two pi shifts of these fields. Um, and then with some, with some bare uh, vacuum energy here, V naught. Now it turns out that, uh, so, so there's P of these terms here. If P is less than or equal to N, then the theory is still interesting, but less interesting from my point of view. 
And in particular, it has only one distinct minimum. But if p is greater than n, as we'll see, even just n plus 1, there are an enormous number of distinct minima at large n. If p is much greater than n, then this tends towards a Gaussian random model. OK, so here's an example with n equals 2, two-dimensional field space, p equals 3. The thing to notice about this is there are some exact symmetries. So this and this are identical, uh, and also this and this. OK, so there are some exact shifts here, which define some kind of unit lattice. Um, but you can see as you move along these directions, or along these directions, that there's some kind of approximate symmetry as well, because things aren't changing very much as you move from here to here, for instance. So there's exact symmetries and there's approximate symmetries that are visible even with such small n. And in fact, it turns out that in general, um, there are always n exact shift symmetries from the just two pi shifts of these fields. But in fact, there are also p minus n approximate shift symmetries, which in the regime I'm considering turn out to be almost exact, but not quite. So there are some hidden symmetries of this theory that are not manifest, uh, but which, which are very powerful. Uh, and they're powerful because they allow you to look at one region of the potential, one minimum, for instance, and then just translate by these approximate symmetries and generate exponentially many more. And this is the trick by which you can find so many minima, and you can find minima with whatever vacuum energy you want. You just start with one, and you shift enough times to find one that has uh, the appropriate value of the vacuum energy. If you want to know how many minima there are, I'll, I'll give you an equation in a moment. Um, but uh, at least for, um, for p, the number of these terms, of order 100, it scales roughly as 10 to the p. So if there are a few hundred of these, uh, of these fields and a few hundred of these cosine terms, then there are more than enough minima uh, to satisfy the constraint that I mentioned, that more than 10 to the 120. OK. Um, <clears throat> so the, the way you can, uh, you can sort of visualize this and, and the way you can identify these approximate shift symmetries is by a nice trick using uh, Lagrange multipliers. So first, change basis and define uh, a new field phi, which is equal to this, these arguments. So phi is this p by n matrix q times theta. So it's just for each cosine, phi is the argument of that cosine. Now, if, there were, if p was less than or equal to n, you could this would just be a rotation in the field space, and then the potential would just be a sum of cosines. That's why there's only one distinct minimum. There's one minimum at every sort of integer lattice site. But if p is greater than n, then uh, um, you've introduced some extra fields. You now have p of these fields phi. And so you have to restrict back to the original field space. And you can do this with some Lagrange multipliers, which geometrically just project you back to some linear subspace of this theory. So here's a, another picture of the same potential. So again, p is equal to 3. So the, this auxiliary space is three-dimensional. But the potential is two-dimensional, so it lives on some plane that slices through this auxiliary space. And uh, these approximate shift symmetries that I mentioned are so exact because that plane passes very close to, but not exactly through, uh, many points in this auxiliary lattice. And so you can understand things through linear algebra in this way. And I won't go through the details, but, but the, the small number, the thing that gives you this very, uh, very close to exact symmetry, is the determinant of the square of this matrix Q, which for large matrices tends to be very, very big. Determinants grow actually super exponentially. So um, a formula for the number of distinct minima, it looks something like this. So basically square root of p factorial times various, uh, various factors. So for instance, if uh, entries of q are plus, minus 1, or 0 with equal probability, p is n plus 1, there are about 10 to the 500 distinct minima um, in this theory. But this analysis applies uh, rather generally. This matrix Q. It just shouldn't be so sparse that it has columns or rows that are entirely zero. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, that's really the only, the only limit. Now, um, these vacua are metastable in general. They're not perfectly stable. They can decay by tunneling. And uh, because of these symmetries of this theory, you can analyze the rates at which these vacua decay. And not only that, the paths that the, uh, that the decay takes. So, so when, a, when a vacuum decays, the field tunnels through a barrier and appears somewhere on the other side, but not typically in a minimum, but rather on, on the slope of a potential. And one can actually uh, estimate where these paths are, which is, is very difficult to do. In fact, it's impossible to do numerically um, with, this large of a, with this number of fields. But you can do it analytically using some tricks. Um, 
uh, and the fact that there are these, that there are these symmetries. Um, and one thing you find is that it's, it's easy for, uh, for these vacua to be very long-lived. So as Kumran mentioned, when uh, the lifetime is determined by tunneling, it can be arbitrarily long, but uh, it's, well, it depends on the parameters of these, of these barriers that you have to tunnel through. Um, but there's no problem in making these vacua uh, live longer than the age of the universe today. Okay, what about uh, field ranges? This is relevant if you want inflation. So uh, there's an old idea. The, the first instance of it that I know was, uh, was called N-flation. Um, and the idea of N-flation was essentially that the diagonal of a cube is longer than any side. So if you had a, a cube in field space with side length M plank, the diagonal is larger by a factor of root N. And there have been a number of related ideas since then in the context of axions mostly. Uh, so KNP or clockwork, kinetic alignment, and so forth. And you can think of this model here as incorporating all of those because it's, uh, it's sort of the most general Lagrangian of this form. And so it, it includes all of, these, all of these mechanisms as special cases. And then you can ask, what kind of enhancement as a power of n can you get? Uh, so in other words, you have some typical field space distance, um, which is usually called f. So that's the scale of this kinetic term, the way of normalized things. And you can ask, how much larger than f, uh, what's the longest distance you can find in, in, in this field space? How much longer than f is it? And it turns out that the, the, the longest uh, it can be is, is, it turns out, is about n to the 3 halves times f. And you can think of, there's sort of three factors of n to the 1 half, which come from different sources. Um, one of them is from this diagonal of the cube. One is from making this Q matrix sparse. Uh, and one comes from the fact that because these matrices are chosen randomly, there's some hierarchy of eigenvalues. And so there are just naturally lighter directions, which have longer range, and uh, uh, heavier directions, which have shorter range when you diagonalize. Now, you might worry about the weak gravity conjecture. Well, first you should worry about, as I said, these uh, more recent swamp lane conjectures. But you may also worry about weak gravity. Uh, however, uh, well, I'll come back to that at, at the end. If there are some extra terms in this potential coming from uh, things like gravitational instantons, weak gravity would be satisfied. Um, and, and it won't, won't affect uh, uh, this part of, of the story. I should also say that, um, <coughs> well, I'm telling you a lot about minima and about regions near minima, so that's when I talk about the field range. I'm really talking about the distance that you can, starting from a minimum, move before you reach, say, a maximum or some other feature of the potential. Um, but you might also ask about saddle points or other features of this potential, and it's, it's very rich. There's, there's, uh, it's a very complicated function. There's tons of, uh, of structure in it, uh, apart from... Uh, from what there is near these minima. Okay, so now I mentioned that in order to get this anthropic story to work, you need inflation after tunneling. Of course, this was known um, uh, quite a while back. In fact, in the 90s, before it was confirmed that the universe was accelerating, it looked like it was open. So without dark energy, a megatonal was something like 0.3. And so uh, people were hard at work trying to find inflationary models that had relatively large negative curvature that were open. And they encountered a difficulty, which is that this kind of tunneling I'm discussing requires a large second derivative of the potential, but inflation requires a small second derivative of the potential. And so you are forced into some very unnatural and tuned looking regime if you have a one dimensional potential where there's a kind of a sharp barrier that you can tunnel through and then a very unsharp, uh, gradually changing potential on which you can inflate. But one interesting thing about this story of, the, of this axion landscape, it changes this completely because there are multiple directions of field space, some of which have large second derivative and some of which have small second derivative. Tunneling takes you through the smallest, thinnest barrier it can find. That's the least action uh, configuration. So it takes you through a direction in which the barrier is quite sharply peaked and thin. Um, and that tends to uh, dump you out on the potential, as I said, not in the minimum, but on some slope. You'll then roll down these sharp directions but you'll still be displaced from the minimum along whatever is the shallowest direction, and that's the one which ends up being the inflaton. Okay, so you tunnel through a sharp barrier, you're somewhere on a slope, and then you gradually roll down uh, into whatever minimum you're in the basin of attraction of. So this can actually give rise to a substantial amount of inflation um, after tunneling. So in contrast to this old story of uh, one-dimensional field spaces, it doesn't require a lot of tuning of the potential. Again, these parameters and these potentials are chosen randomly, so there's no tuning whatsoever. Um, and there's some prediction for the, uh, for the number of e-folds that one expects after tunnelings of this form. Um, <clears throat> and the number of e-folds 
falls off, so that the probability of, of antifolds falls off as a power law, not exponentially. So it has a heavy tail. And so even if the, the average number of e-folds is relatively small, there will be some directions in field space where, uh, where there are a large number of e-folds of inflation um, following a tunneling. Now, um, what about the number of e-folds, what's necessary? Uh, <clears throat> well, in order to, uh, to form structure today, you have to have enough inflation to get rid of this open curvature. So you need enough inflation to solve the curvature problem. And the number of e-folds required to do that is roughly 60. That's where this number 60 comes from. So you need roughly 60 e-folds of inflation, otherwise you won't form any structure. What about this problem with delta rho over rho scanning that I mentioned in the context, in the general context of this anthropic argument for structure? At least as long as you're inflating close to one of the minima of this potential, then you're inflating in a regime which is close to quadratic. It's close to m squared phi squared. And all such inflationary potentials have um, the same value of delta rho over rho. Of course, you can change this value by changing the parameters of the potential. But if these lambdas uh, in the potential, the scale in the potential is around m gut. So again, if you just choose everything randomly and all the dimensionful parameters around m string or m gut, around 10 to the minus 2 times m Planck, and n is in the range of hundreds, then delta rho over rho ends up being a little bit larger than observations by a factor of a few. But it's a small number. It's around 10 to the minus 4. And again, there's no scanning of this, uh, at least so long as we're looking at inflation, inflationary trajectories which lead down into these minima, which are in this quadratic regime. OK, what about the other ingredients in our universe? So a big one is dark matter. Um, <clears throat> This matrix Q here might not be full rank. So if you've forgotten what that means uh, uh, from undergraduate linear algebra, as I, I had when I started thinking about this, it simply means that there are some, say, two columns are not linearly independent. Or what it means here in this potential is that there are some directions in this field space which are, not, which are exactly massless, at least as far as this uh, potential goes. So they, don't, they, don't, uh, they don't get a potential from, from what I've written down here so far. And one expects that there are non-perturbative gravitational corrections which give rise to more terms like this, but with much smaller lambdas in front of them. So rather than lambda up near m gut, lambda would be something like, let's say, m Planck to the fourth, but times e to the minus s, where s is typically m Planck over f, over this uh, axion decay constant. So if f is 10 to the minus 2, then this is e to the minus 100. So it suppresses the, uh, this coefficient a lot. So these contributions can be completely ignored when, uh, when that direction in field space has a potential from here, where, where lambda i is m gut. But if there's a massless, a would-be massless direction, then this is the leading contribution. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, if you believe in the weak gravity conjecture extended to axions, terms like this are necessary to, to satisfy it. And there's a kind of so-called fuzzy miracle. This was emphasized recently by... Um, by Lam Hui and Ostrecker, Germain, and Witten, um, but I think it was originally pointed out, as far as I know, in this paper, which is that uh, with these very light uh, fields that one kind of naturally gets from the scaling, um, <clears throat> the abundance of dark matter ends up roughly correct. So omega dark matter should be something like 0.2, 0 0.25. 0 and uh, with f of order 10 to the minus 2 m Planck, and with a mass that pops out if s is m Planck over f, um, that works out roughly correctly. So it's, it's an analog of the Wimp miracle. There's one number that, that uh, uh, the, the abundance sort of works out with, with natural values for these parameters. Um, that's an interesting coincidence. You could also ask about the strong CP problem and the QCD axion. So again, if this, uh, if this matrix is not full rank, so there's a would-be massless direction, and if these axions are, uh, if there's another term here, so that the axions are coupled to QCD through something like theta times GG dual with, again, let's say, random gut scale uh, coefficients here, then um, this would-be massless direction will get a potential from the usual QCD instantons. It will solve the strong CP problem. And then that QCD axion could be dark matter. Now, this, problem ha this uh, uh, way of getting dark matter has some, has some problems, one of which being that uh, the typical region of the universe will have too much dark matter. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's this sort of misalignment problem. There is, however, an anthropic loophole there, um, according to a paper by Ben Freivogel, so that, that in a universe like that, you'll tend to find yourself in regions where the original misalignment angle just happened to be small, because structure doesn't form in these regions where it's large. So that might not be an issue. You do, however, get too much isocurvature to be consistent with observations. So the perturbations have a, a large isocurvature component, which is not consistent with observation. Um, okay. So I'm running out of time, so let me, let me summarize. Um, so uh, if you take a, a, a random model of uh, order hundreds of axions, random gut scale coefficients, and you uh, simply make the following assumption, that the starting point, if you want, of this theory is some high scale, some typical vacuum, which will have large vacuum energy, and that uh, other phases are populated by tunneling. And then you just ask, of all of the cosmological histories that you can find in this enormously complex theory, let's look at the ones in which structure forms. So some of these histories will tunnel to negative CC vacua and immediately crunch. Some of them will tunnel to positive CC vacua, which are inflating very rapidly and form no structure. Some will, will tunnel to positive CC vacua with small CC, but will still not form structure because they'll be curvature dominated. If we just ask which are the ones that do form structures, and presumably then could have observers in them, we, look at those, we, we see that those histories look very similar to the universe we live in. They'll be roughly this old. They'll be dominated by dark energy now, so there's no problem with this why now problem. It simply happens because uh, 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 if dark energy were, were larger, you would never form structure, and there's no reason for it to be smaller. They're nearly flat. They, they, they underwent 60 folds of inflation, so they have uh, Gaussian perturbations with about the right amplitude. Um, <clears throat> it's easy for them to contain radiation. I might not have mentioned it, but if you couple to QCD like that, you'll reheat, or couple to any part of the standard model, you'll reheat at the end of inflation, so you'll be radiation dominated and then dark matter dominated. So all of these, at least, crude features of the universe seem to be reproduced. Uh, in, in, in a generic uh, one of this ensemble of theories. Um, okay, of course, there are a lot of open questions. The biggest one being, are there any uh, metastable minima at all with positive CC? It's possible there are none. So maybe there is no such theory as this. Um, but if there are, uh, you would worry that this is just a toy model and only contains the axions. What about couplings of all the other moduli? Uh, how do they change this? And then more detailed questions, how, what, uh, what should one assume about this matrix of charges, this Q matrix, or about these kinetic matrices? Um, but I think it's, uh, it's interesting that this was sort of the first try. It was the first, as far as I know, landscape with enough vacua to solve the CC problem, which was also tractable enough that you could actually study these cosmological histories. And it worked surprisingly well. So uh, it seems like this is the sort of uh, the gauntlet, maybe, which has been thrown down. If you want to think about uh, quintessence as an alternative, can you do as well as this? So I'll end there. Thank you. You do in, um, yeah, so, well, it depends on, 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 on the scale. If, um, if F is at the gut scale, then where did I put it? Uh, no, after this. Yeah. Then, then uh, you can get an enhancement as large as, as n to the 3 halves. So if n is 100, um, this can be uh, 10 to the 3. If F is 10 to the minus 2 times m Planck, then yes. Then you'll, you'll, you'll find some directions which have a, a large field range. Yeah, so, so, so. Would that be a problem with this distance? Yeah, it'll be in conflict. Well, I mean, if it applies to any direction in, in field space, then yeah. It does. Yeah, yeah, then, then yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a related question. So, in principle, in this model, you're assuming that uh, all the parameters are independent. Like, you can add as many axions as you want, that mm -hmm. this won't change the entrance of the kinetic matrix. Uh, however, if in string theory, I think. That's not what you expect. And in fact, people have studied models with, say, 50 axions. And you would expect some 100 times individual uh, decay constants. And that could bring you easily beyond the Planck scale, but they didn't find that. So I mean, 
in principle, if you wanted to study this in string models, you would have to include constraints that we don't know how, but could come up into the into this into restricting. You're saying the kinetic matrix would be. So what I'm saying is uh, that maybe you cannot just say I have a hundred axions and all of them have just barely subplankian decay constant and just mix them arbitrarily. That would, in if I take this model, that would give me a hundred m Planck uh, diameter in axion space. Uh, because of the enhancement of n to the three halves. Right, well, well that does depend on k. So, so right. I mean, actually this, this, this technique works for any k or any q. Right. You can plug in whatever you want. This is sort of the maximum enhancement you can get in the best possible case. But indeed, if there's some, uh, if k for instance is diagonal uh, versus not, that, 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 that's one of the things that goes in here. Yes, yeah, so we, we can discuss. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting. I'd actually like more input into what to, what to expect about the kinetic matrix. Well, uh, right. I don't know what to expect, but Example-based uh, scans of the landscape mm -hmm. didn't didn't bring. Didn't, I haven't seen anything that really brought a, a diameter that is a hundred m Planck with fifty axioms. Well, hundred m Planck would be. I mean, this is typically string scale, or not Planck 50, scales. Even even, even 50, that would be. So. Yeah, I mean that. Okay, well let, let's discuss uh, afterwards. Yeah. One more question. <clears throat> So I'm assuming that you, when you say that this uh, method works, uh, is that you're saying that the perturbations are, are going to be um, uh, curvature perturbations mostly, right? That they're not uh, isocurvature perturbations in this... Sorry. Um, I'm assuming that when you say that the method works, do you say that most of the models that you study have uh, basically curvature perturbations? And not a substantial amount of isocurvature perturbations? Do that depends on... Uh, yeah, that depends on the nature of dark matter, right? So, so if there is a very light axion, then there will be a substantial amount of isocurvature perturbations unless the scale is much lower than I've got. Uh, so, so for, you know, you can ask, you can ask that in, in two different ways. I mean, so, so one is um, what's necessary for structure to form, and there it's perfectly okay to have isocurvature perturbations. Uh, the other is what's necessary to agree precisely with observation, and in that case you would have to do something a little different from this if you want dark matter to be one of these axions at least, because yeah, you, you'll have uh, too much isocurvature. It's, it's, not, it's by a factor of a few. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not much too much, but it's a little bit too much. You'd also have two large tensors. So it do, it doesn't, it's not that this model precisely agrees with all cosmolog cosmological observations. What it does do, though, is produce universes which look a lot like the one we live in. I think that, that's sort of the bottom line. And go for coffee uh, outside to the left. <laughs> 